So if you try to listen to it, um, it's going to be eerily silent. Is that is that true? Is that true? <laughs> it's just a weird one. Uh, however, I did record the lecture for my other section. Um, the content is virtually the same. I think I told them one important thing that I intentionally didn't tell you. Uh, you can figure out what that is. See what happens. Uh, no, it's it's basically the same content, so you're good. Uh, if you want to listen to that, it's there for you. <clears throat> right, Casey? Did you listen to it? Take notes. You didn't. That's too bad. <clears throat> so last week we talked about reproductive behavior. One of the things that we talked about sort of continuously throughout that, uh, that lecture and that chapter was hormones. Right? We talked about the influence of hormones on activational, organizational concepts. We talked about how that could drive behavior one direction or the other. I want you to keep those hormones in mind, right? Because we're going to revisit some of those hormones today as we talk about emotion. This is going to be a real thrilling lecture. I tried to say that without any emotion, right? Let's just keep it really flat. <clears throat> uh, so we will talk about fear. That's great. How many of you are fearing those exam grades that are coming out very soon, as we've promised? Um, aggression. How many of you are going to get really angry um, and maybe even like punch your book? Does anybody ever do that? Like stupid book, you didn't teach me enough. Uh, those things can happen. I would advise you to use impulse control when that happens. Uh, and that may have been a real problem for you if your grade's not what it should be, right? Your ability to control your impulses and when someone said, hey, um, I'm going to try to think of the most exciting place you can go in, in Huntington. I'm going to the donut shop. Uh, <laughs> And you said, sure, why not? And then somebody said, which one? And they said, well, you can pick any one of the 80 that we have. We have more donut shops than we have people. Uh, which is bad because, Casey, I don't know if you know this. I used to live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. By the way, that's the headquarters for Krispy Kreme. Okay. There are still more donut shops here. And that was a legitimate city with the headquarters of a legitimate donut company. And there are more donut shops in this town. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know what the obsession with donuts. Who knows? Uh, secondly, or well, I guess fourth uh, on the list, we're going to talk about how you communicate your emotions, right? Because that's important. Believe me. Uh, it's important to accurately communicate your emotions sometimes. And then, Zane, there are some times where it's important to inaccurately convey your emotions, right? And you might think of some great times when you should not have accurately conveyed your emotions that got you into some hot water, right? Uh, some of you may not have uh, great control over your faces, and someone says, hey, what do you think about my new outfit? And you go, <laughs> um, and, and that one, believe me, that one will cause you a whole week of problems. Uh, so now I always answer questions by turning around first um, and then coming back with an answer. Finally, and, and quite honestly, least importantly, uh, we're going to talk about feelings of emotion. Right? And those, why is that least important? Because no one really cares how you feel. It's important what you do. Right? And this is a class about behavior, not really a class about what you feel. I don't really care what you feel. I care what you do. Right? And so this brings up a really nice, important point that emotions are different than feelings. They are not exactly the same. Okay, <clears throat> And we want to keep feelings and emotions separate. I don't care what you say when you get out of this class. In here, let's not use those interchangeably because they're really different. Right? A feeling is your sort of internal experience of your emotion. Your emotion is going to be either a positive or negative reaction to a particular situation, right? <clears throat> and it's going to be either the physiological change and or the behavior that's going to come along with that. Or at least the urge to perform those behaviors. <clears throat> I think, I, I hope, most of you have felt aggression at some point, right? If you haven't, then we have to worry about, you know, like, 
you having some sort of neurological disorder, right? So most people have felt aggression at some point. I would also hope that most of you have not acted upon that aggression most of the time, right? Okay, this happens to me all the time, particularly when I'm driving. Uh, for some reason, I get really upset about what other people do because they do the wrong things on a regular basis. Um, and I try to let them know that in the most polite way I can imagine. Uh, this created a really interesting situation a couple of years ago when I was driving into work and my wife was with me. We were coming down uh, Third Avenue and an ambulance was behind us, Morgan. Uh, and then there was a person driving a van. That should have been my first clue. Anybody who drives a van has got to have problems. Uh, so there was someone driving a van, and I hope none of you drive vans because I really just insulted all of you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this van was in front of us, and I do what you should do. Anytime there's an ambulance behind you, you get out of the way. When the lights are on and the siren's going, you get out of the way. If you don't know that, that's what you're supposed to do. It's highly unlikely that you're dealing with a bigger emergency than someone in an ambulance. It is possible. Okay, and you can, you can, Riley, you can do that calculation on your own. I'm gonna guess most of the time it's not gonna be the case, okay? So you get out of the way. So I got out of the way. This van driver did not, and I went on a rather long string of uh, creations of magic words that I was just throwing at this person uh, because I was rather upset they didn't get out of the way of the ambulance. Why that bothered me that particular day, I don't know. So I, you know, kind of let fly a few things, which my wife thought was hilarious uh, because I don't typically get very angry about too much. So then the ambulance passes, I drive on. Uh, the van stops at Dr. Friday Simpson's. I don't know if you guys know where Dr. Friday Simpson's, never been in there, right? An old lady with a walker gets out of the van, uh, which my wife thought was even more hilarious that I had yelled all of those things uh, at this old lady who was on her way to the doctor, uh, who actually may have been dealing with a larger emergency than the ambulance. I don't know at that point, right? So, um, urges, we'll think about those as well. Many of you have had urges to kick someone, strangle someone, uh, but hopefully you have not done that in decades, right? If you do that when you're five, that's one thing. When you do it when you're 25, it's a completely different thing, right? And then people with those like badges on their shirts get involved and you get to take little tours of places you never wanted to go, okay? So keep that in mind, they cost you money. Uh, you have to get somebody else who wears like a suit and a tie to help you out with those things. All right, so any questions about that? got a pretty clear idea of what we're talking about when we talk about emotions. Uh, we've already talked about hormones. Again, this is going to be important. A lot of the hormones we're going to think about today are coming out of the adrenal medulla. Think about that adrenaline rush. We already talked about that. In particular, these emotions will increase blood flow to muscles, right? A lot of the most important emotions that you will experience are related uh, to uh, fear and aggression. Those are emotions that will require you to do some sort of, or at least have the urge to do some sort of physical activity, right? How many of you have ever been frightened of something? And that happens all the time, right? And sometimes it's a legitimate fear, uh, and that legitimate fear will require you to uh, move your body from wherever it is. It may require you to um, engage in some physical interaction with some other uh, entity other than yourself, right? These things happen. Uh, so you have to be ready for that. These hormones also make um, nutrients available so that you can get things converted into glucose and from glucose you can make some ATP so you have that energy source, right? So that's kind of the process we're going to think about. All right, so fear is one of the best studied uh, emotions. It's also one of the most important to our species. If you ever meet someone who is not afraid of anything, uh, you probably didn't because they're, they're probably dead, right? Because that's what happens. Uh, if you truly have no fear, uh, then what will you do? You'll jump off buildings. That seems like fun. Uh, you will run out into the middle of the street while cars are coming. That seems exciting. Uh, juggle flaming chainsaws. Also thrilling. Uh, these are all things that you might, you might do, right? Galvin, sounds like, a, sounds like a life, right? 
So there you go. Now there are people who do this anyway. Uh, we can talk later about some, you know, dopamine rush. They may get out of that. It's not too big of a deal. Fear, when we think about fear, the brain region we want to think about is the amygdala, okay? This is the guy that gets hyped up when you are experiencing fear or some fearful stimulus is present, okay? Now there are a number of um, parts to the, the amygdala. I'm not really going to get too worked up about that, right? There are subdivisions of the amygdala. Some of them handle inputs, some of them handle outputs. That's not so important, right? Okay, I don't really want you to, to get your heads too deep into that, right? And there's actually also the basal nucleus here that they did not include. But nucleus, I don't know why you couldn't read that. Um, so the basal nucleus. Uh, so these are the uh, sort of parts of the amygdala. Again, the amygdala is going to get excited when you have fear. There are a number of studies that have looked at things like PTSD, for example. Okay. In individuals with PTSD, they have an overactive uh, amygdala. So that amygdala is going to constantly be turned on. It's going to get turned on quite easily, right? And those individuals will have exaggerated fear responses, right, uh, to those situations. So someone may uh, make a, an, an exaggerated or inappropriate response to noise, to flashes of light, right, to perceived threats or, or danger. They may prepare themselves to deal with that um, in a way that someone without PTSD might not do, right? So that's, uh, that's because they've, and we'll talk more about this, about um, fear learning and fear conditioning, things like that, and how that plays a role in the development of PTSD. Other anxiety disorders, you have a similar situation. All right, so the amygdala is going to get hyped up. If you don't have an amygdala, uh, you don't really, don't really do a great job uh, thinking about fear, uh, responding properly to fear. You just sort of do whatever you want. Uh, in studies with monkeys who are missing their amygdala or have had their amygdalas removed, often the subordinate monkeys will continue to try and uh, fight the dominant monkeys. That's normally a bad idea, right? Because the uh, subordinate monkey will, you know, sort of have its head bashed in. Uh, there's a reason that monkey was dominant, right? Because it had bashed in the heads of all the other monkeys. That's how it gets there. So you don't want to keep trying, uh, trying that guy. But uh, monkeys without amygdalas, they'll just keep doing that. Seems like a bright idea. All right, so here you go. This is your amygdala. Again, you know, there are different parts. Don't worry too much. We do want to think about where they are collecting information and where they are sending information, right? The amygdala as a whole. So we're definitely going to get information coming in from your cerebral cortex, from your thalamus. Now remember, that guy was involved in sensory information, right? If you are going to have a fear response, you, you are going to have that to typically some sort of physical stimulus, right? Whatever that stimulus is. Also, you're going to get inputs from the hippocampus. This is a guy involved, we'll talk about later, more about involved in learning and memory. Okay, so that's going to be important. Uh, if you have learned to be afraid of something, it's going to be important to compare that incoming stimulus, whatever that is, with things that you've been afraid of in the past, right? And so you sort of have that, uh, that information available. Now we're going to send information out to a variety of places, but the most in important place we might think about would be the hypothalamus and then some of the places in the hindbrain that will control things like heart rate, re uh, respiration, some of your other sort of uh, physiological uh, processes, right? Because if you are, uh, let's imagine you're, you're on Halger Boulevard. That's a place where I imagine most of you have been and a guy jumps out at you wearing a bear suit carrying a knife. Um, that's also a very likely thing to happen um, on Halgar. Just those three blocks, right? There's just a three block range there where that, that happens on a regular basis. So the guy jumps out and you have some response to that, right? And you need to, you need to, Zach, you really need to do something, right? Whatever that is, you need to, you know, I, I don't know, kick and scream or run or, or stand still and hope you disappear from his vision. I don't know, right? I mean, these are, these are possible responses, right? Uh, fighting, fleeing, and freezing are your typical uh, species, you know, species typical responses. They vary a little bit. Just about everybody will do one of those. There's really nothing else you can do, right? 
you, you can either run away from the danger, you can try to fight the danger, whatever that is, or you can kind of like stand there and see what happens and take your chances, right? Hope you feel sorry for you. I wouldn't recommend that one. No. I would do one of the other two, and you kind of decide which one. Uh, but anything that you do, you're going to need to to get your heart rate going. You're going to need to get breathing faster, right? Because you're getting ready to do some physical activity. Okay. Questions about that? Great. It's actually pretty simple, right? I'm going to draw a guy in a bear costume. Hang in there. It gets better. We didn't have to take a fine arts class when I went to college. There's a, and he's going to hold a knife. I just don't understand why they're horrible. These are his eyes. And yeah, and that's his nose. He's got a, he's angry, so he's flaring his yeah, nose, yeah. right, right? And, and then here are his teeth. Somebody else punched him and he's got a black eye. So that's why one's bigger <laughs> than the other. He tried this trick on somebody else. They decided to fight. You might try fight or flee. It's up to you, right? Last guy did the fight and punched him in the face. Not hard enough, apparently. Because if you punch someone hard enough, they'll stop doing these things, right? Because then he will learn fear, and then his amygdala will get geared up the next time he tries to frighten somebody, right? Just a loop. Okay. Questions about that? Great. He's also probably wearing a Marshall sweatshirt. <laughs> not that he's a, not that he's affiliated with the university in any way. I'm not making that claim. I'm just simply saying somehow he's got his hands on a Marshall sweatshirt because that happens. All right. Here's the entire list of outputs from the central nucleus of the amygdala. I'm not going to ask you to memorize every single one of these outputs, right? Okay, so that's, that's not important. But what is important is to think about in general what are these guys doing, right? Here we have one that's uh, increasing respiration, okay? Uh, here we are, we're activating, uh, you know, your, your sympathetic nervous system, okay? Get you going a little faster. Here's one that could activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, this could actually cause you to do some fun things when you get frightened, like urinate or defecate, right? I don't know if anybody has uh, seen a situation where someone has been so frightened that they do one of those things. Um, it can happen, okay? and here's exactly why. That particular uh, one. Here we have uh, increased vigilance, cortical activation. These are all things here. This will augment your startle response, right? Here's freezing, okay? This guy, and later we'll talk a lot about facial expressions and why facial expressions are important. Uh, this will actually cause facial expressions of fear, right? So you'll lose these, you know, frightening faces uh, or faces of being frightened. I think a frightening face would be one that was like really trying to scare you, but this is a face experiencing fright, so that's the opposite. Again, don't try to memorize all of these. Just know in general uh, what happens when you get scared. That's what's happening. Okay? All of that's coming out of the amygdala. All right, so briefly, we are going to take a little side trip into sort of the learning and memory section. We're just going to put our toe in it, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a, a, a brief introduction to think about a couple things. Later, I'm going to give you a whole lot more details about this, and then we'll reference back to this. But this is actually something that's important to know for, uh, for this fear situation. A lot of studies that have looked at fear have looked at what we call the conditioned emotional response, right? And this is just using your basic classical conditioning. Most of you know about that, but we'll give you a brief sort of run through of what that is to get a fear response. <clears throat> now the traditional way to do this, very effective uh, with rats. So you can do, you can take a rat, you put it in a box, uh, and then what you do is you flash a light, okay, you can turn on a light, you can make a noise, uh, you could stick a you know, I don't know, a blue stick, it, whatever you want to do, okay? It's something that normally would not frighten a rat, right? And so turning on a light typically won't do that. So you just flash a little light bulb right now. Give you a 
And then you do something that would probably frighten most of us, and including the rat. Uh, you provide a nice little jolt of electricity to it. Okay? So you flash a light, you shock a rat. You flash a light, you shock a rat. You keep doing this enough, and then all of a sudden one day you flash the light, and what does the rat do? It's scared. It has that fear response, right? Okay? Whether or not you provide the shock. And then, for a little while, you can actually just flash the light, and the rat will become... You know, show that fear response, whatever that is, right? So that can happen. Now, if you keep flashing that light and you don't shock the rat, eventually the rat will go, this flash of light is no longer a good predictor of something bad happening to me, so the light comes on and the rat doesn't do anything. Okay? But what's interesting about this is at some time in the future, you really at any time in the future, you put the rat in there, you flash the light, and you give that rat a shock. The next time you turn on that light it will respond as though you had always been doing the light and the shock, the light and the shock, okay? The first time you try to teach it light, shock, light, shock, you may have to do this 20, 30, 40, 50 times. Depends on how stupid your rat is, okay? And you can substitute rat with child if you want, right? Uh, because think about your children, right? I mean, you try to teach them things. If you have children, a dog, a cat, how many of you have a goldfish? You tried to teach it a trick. It's the same idea. Shock it. But that kill, I guess that might, you think that'd kill a goldfish? Everything. Everything kills a goldfish, yeah. Do not talk harshly to your goldfish, it will die. <laughs> kind words only. Uh, but it's the same process, right? It's the same sort of classical conditioning process that you guys know about. We always think about Pavlov and his um, salivating dogs. Interestingly, Pavlov had no interest in classical conditioning. Pavlov was really, you know what he was interested in? dog salivary glands. Like, why that gets somebody going, I don't know, man, I'm going to study dogs and saliva. That seems, like I'm going to devote my life to this, right? Uh, so he did, and that got him zero credibility. Nobody cared, right? And then all of a sudden, they're like, clanking, he had a clumsy technician, I guess, this is how I imagine. Clanking bowls together, and he was like, man, that dog's really slobbering. I don't know why. And then he's like, clanking bowls, it gets food. And so it learned clank, food, clank, food. We always think it was a bell. I think that was good PR on the Pavlov side. He's like, oh yeah, no, all along I was studying, uh, you know, learning mechanisms uh, and, uh, you know, ringing a bell and then the dog salivates. It's exactly what I was trying to do. Don't let him fool you. He's been trying to fool people for hundreds of years. Okay? We're stopping it now. It's a crazy story. And that's why I always believe in keeping doors open. You never know when something exciting is just going to fall in your lap, like a big glob of dog saliva. Like a man in a bear suit. You think the IRB would approve that? If we could get one of you guys to dress up like a bear uh, with a fake knife and jump out and just see what people do. Anybody want to be the guy in the suit? I'm not going to. I'm, we've got, we got, we got one volunteer right there. Extra credit. If I could get that by the IRB and you would be willing to do it, I'd probably give you an A for the class. I mean, that's just... Uh, just let them know afterwards. Yeah, but it's... No harm. No, well, we'll do this. We'll put the informed consent on your, on your shirt. We'll just print it, right? By reading this shirt, you are consenting to being scared by this guy in a bear suit. I think that would work. Put the Marshall on it. Yeah, just Marshall and, we'll, you know, I don't know. We'll put something on it. Sounds exciting, right? So there you go. That's a brief uh, introduction to that. Now, later we're going to talk about what brain mechanisms happen there. I don't know if I want to tell you about Garcia's rats now or later. We'll think about that later because I think it fits better later when we talk about ecological learning. Some people use the phrase prepared learning. Um, I don't really like that word very much. I like the word ecological learning, which I think is a lot cooler. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. It'll be exciting. But keep Garcia's rats in mind, right? So, here's what I just told you. Rat, shock, it jumps, whatever. Uh, you put it in the blue room, it gets used to that. All right, it's going to be afraid. Whatever. Don't worry about context too much. That's it's not going to be too important to you for right now, but we've covered everything you sort of need on that. Uh, again, so that's in rats. We know this. Uh, we can lesion the uh, 
the amygdala in rats, and they don't learn to be afraid of things, right, no matter what we do. Same thing happens in humans, actually. So the amygdala is really responsible for those human emotional responses. If you don't have an amygdala, now there are a couple reasons why you might not. One is you could have brain damage. That could be the result of a head injury or a stroke or a degenerative disorder, right? So those things can happen. Or you may have had your amygdala removed, not intentionally, uh, but because you had something like temporal lobe epilepsy or you had some other brain tumor and they had to take out some surrounding tissue as well, that might have included your amygdala, okay? So there are a couple reasons there why you might not have uh, an amygdala. But it's definitely gonna decrease your emotional response, right? So if someone doesn't have an amygdala and you go up and you like, you know, kick them in the shins, they might say, eh, that really wasn't all that pleasant. I prefer you to stop. Uh, you know, if you go up and you kick somebody who actually has an amygdala in the shins, they might kick you back or yell at you or, or something, right? There's gonna be some response. It also impairs the, uh, as we said, the conditioned emotional response. And it actually interferes with your, um, like uh, memory of emotions, right? And so this is a sort of an interesting study a number of years ago in Japan. Uh, there was a, uh, a group of individuals who had uh, damage to their amygdala, right? So their amygdalas were, were not present. Uh, and there was a severe earthquake, right? And so it, I don't know if any of you have lived through an earthquake. This isn't story time, so we're not really gonna ask you to share. But most of you have lived through some sort of frightening event, right? Uh, whether that was a, a hurricane, a tornado, um, you know, house fire, couldn't find your lucky socks, I don't know, I'm really stretching here, right? Uh, you've, you've lived through some sort of stressful uh, event, and when you think about that event, it probably brings up emotional memory. You might think about how um, angry you were, how distraught you were, right? And you, you'll, you'll have those emotional sort of memories. When you ask these folks, so tell me about that earthquake, if they don't have an amygdala, they'll say something like, yeah, it was a Tuesday, I was eating a turkey sandwich, room started shaking, I remember I dropped my sandwich. Uh, you, you know, they're not going to tell you if, you know, those of us who have an amygdala live through an earthquake, and I said, it was really frightening, the room was shaking, I thought I was, you know, in real danger, I was cowering under the, the table to try to protect myself, I didn't know what was going on, right, there are going to be sort of different responses to that. So there you go. So that's the amygdala. Uh, kind of what the amygdala does. We'll talk about that a little bit more. We also want to talk about this guy, the medial prefrontal cortex. And this guy's really important. And so these are sort of the two brain regions that we're going to think about constantly battling each other, right? The medial prefrontal cortex is involved in the extinction of those conditioned emotional responses. So remember that time we were just flashing that light and we weren't shocking the rat? During that time, their MPFC, that's the abbreviation here, their MPFC is getting excited, right? It's going, wait a minute, you don't, have to get, you don't have to get excited about this, you don't have to get nervous, you don't have to be afraid. The light comes on, nothing happens. The light comes on, nothing happens, right? And it's gonna keep shutting down that amygdala, okay? So the amygdala is not gonna run away, cause all of those other responses. Remember all of those outputs that get you geared up for some sort of uh, fear response. All right, uh, here's some evidence in humans. We talked a lot about this nothing to worry about uh, too much. This is one of the studies uh, where they used humans. They would shock them briefly. Nothing that was, you know, I guess, harmful. We'll go with that. Uh, they would have to pick between a couple visual stimuli, nothing, nothing too serious. They were monitoring activity in the medial prefrontal cortex, and they noticed that uh, it was an increase in activity during that extinction phase, okay? There is a sort of another part, uh, sort of a subdivision there when we're thinking about prefrontal <laughs> cortex, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? So we've kind of just become a little more specific about what's going on. This is going to be in the front, obviously. Um, it's going to be toward the middle, and it's going to be on the bottom, right? This plays an important role in the analysis of social situations. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, social situations are complex, right? You have to decide what you're going to do. There's a set of behaviors that are acceptable here, right? Uh, and there are a set of behaviors that would be acceptable if you were, uh, you know, at the Jones C. Edwards Stadium on Saturday, right? 
some of those behaviors are not acceptable in this classroom. Uh, for example, the wave, not acceptable in here. So I don't, no one do that. That's, Calvin, you just went down. You're going to have to ask Zach for some bear suit points to pass this class. Uh, so, for example, yelling, screaming, shouting, uh, those are all perfectly acceptable things, right? If you're, you know, down toward 20th Street, not so great here, right? Okay. As much as I really want you to get excited about this class, I don't want anyone to stand up and yell, go amygdala, uh, right? That's not going to really work. But uh, if you were to yell, like, you know, go Marshall at the stadium, that would be fine. Things that's, that don't really work well at the stadium, like trying to have a conversation with someone about neurological processes and behaviors, right? That's probably, you're not going to sit next to the, you know, some guy you don't know and be like, hey, so you see that guy out there, uh, his amygdala is really working right now as he's uh, snapping the ball. You see that middle linebacker, it's really, that's a fearful stimulus. I mean, that guy's like, you know, 6'3", 230, uh, probably, probably runs a, you know, 4'1", 40 or something. He could really just flatten this quarterback who's, I don't know, 6'2", 180, I'm making things up here, right? That would really scare me. Uh, so, but he's going to have to get his, uh, his uh, prefrontal cortex in gear so that he doesn't just, you know, like cry or wet his pants uh, when he's out there and snaps the right. I mean, these, these are real things, Casey. Uh, and so that's going to have to really work. I always think about, like, if I was going to make the ideal, uh, you know, NFL quarterback, I would lesion his amygdala. I would just get rid of that amygdala. Because, I mean, those guys are big, right? And they're usually not. Uh, unless you're like Cam Newton. And, and then Cam Newton has two things going for him. Why he's not afraid. One, he's as big as a middle linebacker. And two, his brain doesn't work like it should. Uh, and, and, and that's a true statement because of all the head injuries he's, right? So you can't really anticipate that his brain's going to work like it should, given the number of times he's been hit in the head. Uh, so I, I don't really know if he can evaluate the likelihood that he's going to be injured out there or not. So he just goes out and does whatever. He did not. He did not. He should have had that. The airbag for his brain, right? That's what he needs. <clears throat> uh, some people need airbags for their mouths. But that's a whole separate issue. Again, this is why I do not get upset when guys in the NFL say things that are stupid or offensive. Um, it's really hard to get mad at someone with brain damage. And I just assume all of them have brain damage. Uh, and that's a true statement, right? I'm not, I'm not like making some sort of like joke about it. They seriously have had a decades of head injuries, and and that's caused some problems for them. And we're seeing that now, like more and more than than what we would really care to admit to, right? Because so many people still like turn their TVs on Sundays and hope they see someone get hit so hard their helmet flies off, right? And then they get really puzzled when that guy, like ten years later, does something really crazy. They're like. At that time you got hit in the head like every day for all of the first 35 years of his life not so surprising he does crazy things now so there you go we'll talk about a lot about CTE later um, which is kind of interesting so social situations we need that ventral medial prefrontal cortex right and again we've talked about this getting uh, you know when you go through that extinction phase prefrontal cortex gets geared up about that. Here's your ventral medial prefrontal cortex, as I said. It sits on the bottom front in the middle, right? That's where we get all of these fun words. <clears throat> how many of you guys know, how many of you know this guy, Phineas Gage? You guys know, yeah, Phineas Gage, right? Phineas Gage had a bright idea once. He decided to shoot a rocket through his brain. Uh, which, <laughs> he didn't decide to do that, it just happened. He had a really fun job of sticking dynamite into a hole. Uh, if, if there's ever a job you don't want, that's it. Because here's how they used to put dynamite in a hole. So you would have dynamite, somebody drilled a hole, and then you've got to take a metal rod that's kind of pointed on one end and jam it down in there. It's called a tamping rod, right? And so you're standing over this hole, driving a missile, right, onto a charge. And occasionally, as happens, the cap goes off, and you just shot a four foot long piece of metal, a metal rod, straight out of a hole, right? Okay, and that's what Phineas Gage did. Now, most of the time, you would imagine either A, your head was, because this is like how I I'd get one of those reachers, you know, those things that the old people use. I just like stand back and use the tamping rod that way. That's the safe way. Um, 
most of the time you would imagine if you shot a piece of metal through your head this long and like this big, you're going to die. Somehow, I, I don't know what he did, he was standing on one leg, had his head tilted just right, whatever happened, he blasted that straight through his head. It landed like 30 or 40 feet away from him, right? So we're not talking about like a little love tap from this thing, okay? We're talking about literally he shot a missile through his head. Um, amazingly, he didn't die, okay? Uh, what he did was completely obliterate his ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And after that, he did a lot of weird things, right? His behavior totally changed. His, uh, his, his personality changed. He had no ability to understand these complex social situations and how he should behave in those, right? So instead of coming into class and sitting down and, you know, just taking notes or at least, you know, quietly playing Angry Birds, he, uh, he would just stand up and start singing, I'm a little teapot, I don't know. He would just do really weird things, right? Because he had no ability to judge what he should have been doing. So there you go. That's exciting, right? I wouldn't recommend that as a career choice. Huh? He, he, he did. He did take pictures. Which, I mean, I would too, right? I mean, I'd carry that thing around. If I shoot a giant piece of metal through my head and I live through it, I'm taking that thing everywhere. Because that's, that's a great conversation starter. You sit down at a bar and you put down you know, a giant missile that you shot through your brain, I think you're getting free drinks. I mean, I really think that's going to happen. Because people are just going to buy you a drink to, to hear that story. So, yeah. No, it's a crazy story. Crazy. It's amazing. All right. We already talked about some of this. We talked about the amygdala. We talked about the metromedial prefrontal cortex for that extinction. Basically telling you don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Not a big deal. Now, most people, and we're just going to assume everybody, is born with a functional amygdala, okay? When you slide out of that uterus, your amygdala is ready to roll, okay? And that's okay. That's great. Because guess what can happen to you? Lots of things, right? Like, lots of things can kill you. And you should be ready to just respond as though you're going to die, no matter what happens to you, right? And that's a great way to ensure survival. And little kids do this. If you think about babies, what do they do when they're hungry? They scream like they're going to die. What do they do when there's like human waste stuck to their bodies? They scream like they're going to die. What do they do when they want like, I don't know, what do little kids use? Chewing gum at the store. They will get in the floor and they will roll around and kick their feet like they're going to die because you didn't buy them the latest, I don't know, My Little Pony toy. Do they still make those things? Anybody? I, don't, I don't know. I'm just grasping at straws here, right? <clears throat> Does that work? That is a toy, right? All right. My sister had some of those when we were younger. She took a black marker and, like, marked on everything, like, randomly. It is. She didn't mark on anything I owned. That's why I still like her. She did, she did mark all over the back of my parents' couch. Yeah. I didn't get too worked up about that. My mom's philosophy was I probably shouldn't have left the marker where she could get it. Uh, which was, was really, you know, a way to own up as a parent, right? Like, you can't be mad at, like, a three-year-old for just randomly marking on things if somehow you have left a magic marker down where they can reach it. I mean, that, that seems like a reasonable thing. So your amygdala is ready to go from birth, right? Very early in development, you get that anger, you get those violent emotional reactions. That's why you see little kids do this all the time. Now, as you get older, your prefrontal cortex starts to come online. It matures a bit later, right? And so then you start to realize, hmm, maybe the best approach in this situation is not for me to cry and wail and kick my feet. But maybe there are other things I can do to get the items that I want, right? And to get the things that I need. And so you start to be able to see the negative consequences of your behavior, right? And this really doesn't, the, the prefrontal cortex really doesn't start developing and reach full maturity until late childhood into early adulthood, right? And we really see this uh, if you think about your behavior even just a few years ago, right? Some of the things that you thought, well, that was really awesome to do. Uh, and then now you look back and you're like, wow, I was a real idiot then um, and really wasn't thinking about those negative consequences, right? Okay. <clears throat> None of you have, have had those moments for one of two reasons. Either A, you've not done anything stupid 
or B, you've not yet hit that you know, prefrontal cortex maturity level yet. Someday it will happen. Hang in there. I promise you. You're going to look back and think, why, why did I think it was great to try to drive down the road as fast as I can and throw water bottles into other people's cars? Like, that was a thing that people did, right? Is that ever a thing you've, you've tried to do? Like, try to throw water bottles in people's windows while you're driving down the road? Oh, well. You should give it a try. It's cheap. I mean, water bottles are pretty cheap, right? No, nobody's going to try that one. All right, well, there you go. I'm sure there's some other equally idiotic craze you're going to try, or have tried, right? There you go, negative consequences. <coughs> need to be ready for those. Anything else I need to tell you about? I think later we'll talk about snakes. That's going to be exciting. How many of you love snakes? Okay, two people, a couple weirdos, that's fine. Uh... JP, did I ever tell you about the time I had a student bring a snake to class on exam day? Oh, because the face friend? Yeah, yeah, that was a crazy one. And she just came in and was like, I'm so sorry. My kid, my, like something fell from her ceiling and shattered the aquarium. She's like, I really had nowhere else to put my snake. Can I still take the exam? I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, just don't ask it any questions. That happened at my... Yeah, it happens. Yeah. It was a small class. Thankfully, I could move people that were afraid of snakes somewhere else. I mean, and their, and their like anxiety level was already high because it was like it was a final exam, I and mean, it was like already up there. All right. Well, we'll talk about snakes. Okay. Um, aggression. So let's move past fear a little bit. Think a little bit about aggressive behavior. We're not going to talk a whole lot about this. There's sort of you know a few basic types of aggressive behavior: threat behavior. Uh, defensive behavior, there's submissive behavior, and then sometimes folks throw uh, predation in there if you're trying to eat something else. Slightly different kind of aggression. Uh, not a big deal. Most of these types of aggression are going to be related to uh, reproduction or the resources that you need for reproduction, right? So a lot of uh, aggressive behaviors will be what we would call like, um, you know, mate defense, right? or mate guarding, trying to prevent uh, someone from taking your mate. Particularly works, as JP knows, if you're a crab or a lobster, crayfish, uh, those things happen. Squirt that urine out your eyes. Yeah, uh, a true story, uh, crustaceans, some crustaceans when they're in a fight, they'll actually squirt urine out of their eyes to try to like deter the other, I know it's, think about that Andre, like that's like a great superpower, right? I mean, it's like. You should write up that movie. I mean, they're making movies about every superhero. You know, like, I, Urine Man. I don't know what you would call that guy. Um, <clears throat> I, I was just thinking about where he lives. Then I was going to make, like, an IT joke about an IP address. Um, and I just, I, that didn't go very well, but I was thinking about things I could do with that. It's more of a sight gag, I think. Um, should guys, huh? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so, there you go. Not a big deal. The amygdala will get geared up for this, right? And in particular, we'll send things out to the periaqueductal gray. There's sort of two places there. Uh, one's the dorsal uh, region, which is going to be for those like defensive type behaviors. And then predatory behaviors are going to be controlled by a different um, brain nucleus, which tells you there's something different about trying to hunt down food if you're a predator versus trying to defend yourself against an attack from someone else, you know, part of your, part of your, um, someone that's in your own species group. Which makes sense, right? I mean, if you think about how many of you have ever seen a cat eat a rat or a mouse, that's a completely different process than when two cats fight each other, which you've probably also seen, right, or you can imagine. Uh, it's a different set of behaviors. Riley, you can look that up on YouTube if you want. It's like, type in cat fight or something and see what comes up. Hey, who loves serotonin? Serotonin's a great one. Uh, serotonin will actually inhibit aggression. 
So as your serotonin levels go up, your aggression goes down. This is why they will sometimes give folks SSRIs if they are aggressive or irritable. Kind of knock that down a little bit. <clears throat> uh, there have been some studies in animals where they've destroyed your or their serotonergic uh, axons, which will cause them to be more aggressive. It's kind of interesting. This is a very confusing graph. I think it's a great graph. Uh, I'm going to just tell you what's going on here because it's you're going to get lost in it if you try to. Uh, you know, I've taught this class a number of years, and I still am not certain I'm able to pull out of this graph what's important. Uh, the basic idea here is this was a study with monkeys, okay, and they would measure the monkeys. Uh, the assume this is just 5-HT or serotonin. That's just a derivative of serotonin. So they would pull out this fluid from the monkeys. They would measure how much serotonin was present. And then they would see how long that monkey actually sort of lived, right? Did the monkey die? Did the monkey live for a long time? What was going on? And what you can really take away from this graph is if you had higher serotonin levels, okay, you were more likely to still be alive at the end of the study than if you had lower serotonin levels, right? And the reason for that is if you have low serotonin levels, you're going to be more likely to be aggressive and participate in sort of risk-taking behaviors. Okay. What are the risk-taking behaviors for monkeys? We've already talked about subordinate monkeys attacking dominant monkeys. Other things that monkeys might try to do, jump from one branch to another, right? And if you think, well, I can definitely make that, uh, and you take that risk, you may not make that. Right? You might not jump from one tree to the other, and then you end up on the ground. You could be injured or eaten by a, by a predator, right? So you're, you're possibly going to die. What I think is interesting about this is uh, you still know, and then you would think, well, like, why would you have some monkeys with low serotonin levels, right? Why would you want risk-taking monkeys? The problem, and you can extrapolate this to, to human society, the problem is if no one in your society is a risk-taker, there's no advancement when you run into problems, right? That's perfectly fine if you can stay in one place. There's a constant food and water source. You constantly have protection from predators. But as soon as you run out of one of those resources, you really need someone who's willing to take some sort of risk to, to try to relocate, to try a different approach to uh, you know food procurement, to try to find a different place uh, that's defensible, right? So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so you want a good mix there. We've already talked a little bit about aggression and hormones. We talked about that in response to testosterone. Okay. We already talked about the, uh, and we'll revisit this now, the, uh, you know, the, the 2M, the 1M, and the 0M females, which is kind of interesting. So basically, it, it's true in rodents, but it's pretty well true in all uh, species that uh, for males you get androgens, we're thinking about testosterone here. Okay. You're going to have some of that prenatally to, to drive that organizational uh, process and then later at puberty you sort of see a spike in testosterone levels. You also see a spike in what we call intermale aggressiveness, so males start fighting each other. True of uh, rodents, also true of humans, monkeys, basically every, every species you can think of. Uh, that has testosterone. When you have a spike in testosterone, you see a spike in aggressiveness, right? So there you go. In general, females are going to be less aggressive than males. This is true for nearly every species, right? Uh, so we can just kind of assume that as a general rule, there are some exceptions. Uh, what's interesting is that testosterone also seems to facilitate aggression in females for the most part. I love this particular diagram. I don't know why. I think it's funny these two kids, you know, try, it's, just, it's just like a like an odd sort of situation, right? Uh, so here you go. This is uh, looking at serotonin. This is a low serotonin level. Here they are. They're, they're buddies, although this kid still looks like he's, I mean, look at his face. He still looks like he's just a little bit, uh, I don't know, right? I mean, would you trust a kid with that face? 
got my arm around you, but watch out. I mean, has he got like a pair of scissors stabbing him in the back there? I don't know, right? I mean, it's just, he's got that look on his face. Like, I wouldn't trust that. Uh, but they've blocked the reuptake of serotonin, so you have more serotonin at the synapse. So he's a lot happier now. This is not my endorsement to give kids SSRIs, right? That's not something I would... I'd recommend not giving kids medications if you can help it. The things that are inside their heads here are still doing stuff. And if you start screwing around with that, you don't know what's going to happen. There are times, Juwan, when you would need to give them something, right? So just, you know, weigh that out with your, you know, medical professionals, right? This is not a big deal. These are, uh, we're looking at interfemales. So we're looking at females. Um, if you give them, you know, just a placebo or an estrogen, then you don't really see much of an increase in their aggressive behavior. If you shoot them with some testosterone, though, they have a uh, pretty massive increase in the number of fights that they might have. This is just in a 20-minute period. They'll end up, you know, maybe having a fight five or six times uh, across 20 minutes, whereas normally you might just have, you know, one or two fights during that 20-minute period. So there you go. We've seen a similar diagram to this before, again, looking at those organizational and activational effects of hormones, right? So if immediately after birth you uh, give them a placebo and then you try to give that rat testosterone as an adult, you really don't get much aggressiveness, right? Because we're not getting that organizational effect, right? That early system that's going to be ready to activate aggressive behavior later. If immediately after birth, during development, they're exposed to testosterone. We've done the organizational part of that, right? The next step is the activational step. So when that rat is fully grown, if you don't give it any injection, okay, so for example, you don't give it any kind of uh, um, hormone, you're not gonna get much aggressive behavior out of that. If you give them uh, a dose of testosterone, and, and this is important to keep in mind, these are females, uh, that's why if they were males, you would see there a, uh, a natural dose of testosterone, right? But uh, if you give them testosterone as adults, then you see an increase in aggressive behavior. So that's pretty exciting, right? So there you go. I'm just thinking about these, like, pumps, right, that you could put on your body, and you could just, like, turn up or turn down testosterone levels depending on how much aggressiveness you need at the moment. It's pretty exciting, right? Uh, you know, you're, you're just home, like, slicing up some carrots, crank it down a little bit. Uh, you know, but if you're, uh, you know, if you're out and you're, let's say you're a, you know, I don't know, a Greco-Roman wrestler, you might want to crank up the testosterone a little bit, right? You want to be ready for that. Anybody here Greco-Roman wrestler? Nobody? I really thought we might have some, you know, because they have that big invitational tournament, right, down there at the big Sandy Superstore Arena. Anybody ever been to that? Nobody's interested in that at all, right? I, I, which always puzzles me, like why they have that. And then you ask people, and nobody's ever been. But they have it every year, right? Is this in, you guys should try to compete next year. I think it's only for high schoolers, but nobody's going to notice. Casey, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? I was like, are you talking about that, or are you <clears> talking <throat> about like, the, the contest where they have the strong... Oh, the race? tough man. Yeah. Yeah, that's something different. Yeah, that's a completely different thing. Um, you've been to the Tough Man? No, the Oh. Okay. That sounds exciting. It's, it's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could see that happening, right? I mean. <clears throat> well, that might be worth your time. I don't know. You guys can check that out. It was 10 bucks to get in? Oh, well, there you go. That's not going to be the worst 10 bucks you've ever spent. I'm certain. <laughs> hey, look at this. This is, remember that time I drew a picture of a rat uterus? It didn't look as good as this, did it? Uh, which, again, is why I'm not, I'm not a medical artist. This is a rat uterus. We already talked about this, right? This is your 0M uh, female, your 1M female, and your 2M female. You guys have already seen this. We've already talked about it. This particular 
uh, female is going to be the most aggressive, right? Followed by the 1M and then the 0M females, right? Because they're not exposed, you know, you're getting testosterone floating over from both of these guys, but only one of these guys over here, okay? And so that organizational, this is an organizational. effect, right? Because this is early on <clears throat> driving the development of those brain structures that later will be sensitive to testosterone and will drive aggressive behavior. <clears throat> Fun stuff. These two words you will need to know and you will need to know what this means. Okay, Prenatal androgenization. <clears throat> this is an important concept. I'm going to give you a moment to write that down five times. Adrian, if you get copy and paste enough, because I really want yeah. that five times in your notes. <clears throat> You're going to need it one more time. <clears throat> okay. What does prenatal mean? <clears throat> That's before you leave the uterus. Okay. What does androgenization mean? Well, androgens, we already know, those are the male hormones. Right? So it's simply exposure to testosterone in the uterus during development. That's it, plain and simple, okay? <clears throat> However, this has massive effects on behavior later. In every single species that has been studied, including primates, <clears throat> and if you want to think about a subgroup of primates, <clears throat> that, that would be humans, prenatal androgenization increases aggressive behavior, okay? <clears throat> That's it, it's that simple. <laughs> okay. This sets up your nervous system to respond to testosterone later, particularly on or about puberty. It's that simple, right there. <clears throat> we talked about, uh, you know, males in particular, uh, something to think about. Females that we talked about, remember we talked about CAH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, right? So we talked about that. These are females whose adrenal glands are pumping out testosterone, right? And we said they are more likely to be aggressive or have aggressive behaviors as adults than females who do not have that particular condition. <clears throat> females who shared a uterus with a male, right? Uh, which would be like a fraternal twin situation more likely to be aggressive, okay? Now, we're not talking about, um, in those cases, a female who's going to be as aggressive as a male, okay? We're not talking about a female who's just gonna grab a hockey stick and run around and whack people in the face with it, right? <clears throat> we're talking about measurable and significant, but small increases in aggressive behavior, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? It's pretty cool, right? So there you go. How many of you think, boy, I'm just a little extra aggressive than like all of my peers? You probably had a little extra testosterone during the uterus time. Does that also mean like if a female has <clears throat> an older brother? Because I know, isn't there a thing like if you have a like, younger brother or someone that can be like homosexual or what have you? I think I think it would be I think they would be less aggressive. The idea with that particular idea is that <clears throat> the female has uh, the mother has created some antibody to testosterone, and so would reduce testosterone levels in subsequent births, right? And so there might be some decrease in testosterone if you were to have a um, uh, a male and then a female. Um, so I mean. I doubt you would see a decrease in aggression in females because aggressive aggression is already pretty low. So it'd be kind of hard to say, you know, like, yeah, you're less aggressive. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, but if your mom, like, you know, took testosterone supplements, that might, I mean, that's something, right? <clears throat> Anybody take, you don't have to answer, because please don't, because I'm going to tell you it's a bad idea. Uh, one, it's a bad idea. I mean, now if your doctor says, hey, you're absolutely not making testosterone, you probably need to take some testosterone, right? Because you need some male or female to make things work. 
uh, right? That's pretty good. But I think about these guys, Juwan, you, you probably see these like uh, these testosterone ads, right? Like like take testosterone. I think it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you have some things that make testosterone, and if you start taking outside testosterone, those things stop making testosterone, right? There's just like, hey, we've already got plenty. I can just like stop making testosterone, and then. I always wonder later if you stop taking those pills, like, are your testicles going to kick back in and, like, actually start doing their job? I don't know. It's, it's concerning. Secondly, um, a few of you in this room have a prostate, right? And uh, I don't know if any of you are thinking about your prostates or not, but at some point in your life you're going to have to, right? Because there's a good chance that those of you that do have a prostate are going to have a problem with it. That tends to happen, right? I mean, that's, that's a thing. That happens. Uh, one of the things they will give you to treat your uh, prostate problems are um, uh, medications that decrease your testosterone levels, right? Because the testosterone sort of screws around with your prostate, right? So there you go. <clears throat> That's uh, like um, what's the what's the grow hair pill? Rogaine. Not Rogaine. The what's the pill you take? Propecia. Anybody know? Nobody's going to admit that, right? That's like asking, what's that pill that fixes erectile dysfunction? I've never heard of that one. <laughs> nobody's nobody's going to own up to that one, right? I think it's called Propecia because alopecia is um, losing hair, and so Propecia would be like growing. I think it is Propecia. Uh, propecia actually was originally a, uh, like a, and it's also a medication they'll give you to treat prostate issues because it decreases. To, one of the reasons you start to lose your hair um, is, is uh, testosterone sort of interferes with that. That's why you have... It's called male pattern baldness, not female pattern baldness, because it's not related to estrogens. It's related to testosterone. Do you need to like stand aside <clears> or do you need to see? And then like every two weeks before you come see me, just see what? No. Turn around. Like, no. Turn around. Turn around. Come in, and they're like, I, I like, like, I have to ID them sometimes, and they're like 15, 14 years old, and they're like, yeah, like I need this testosterone booster, man. And they're like, oh, like the Jeez. Balance of I worry about that because I'm thinking of the, no, it is. I'm thinking about the things I was doing at 14 that I wasn't doing, like like that like later in my life I was doing, and that I definitely needed testosterone for. Uh, that if I had been like screwing around with testosterone at 14, I might not have been able to participate in those activities later. And I'm thinking that's just not a good trade. It's not a good trade at all. <clears throat> so, there you go. That's the way it goes. Yeah, again, they, they're really only two or three things they should be considering. Like some protein shakes are fine. Uh, some creatine powder is okay. Uh, and then if they want just like a little like wake you up in the morning or, or before you go to work, a little caffeine would be fine too. Um, the other stuff I'd stay away from. It is, right? It is. You don't know. And then it's probably just like some random guy in his garage like making that stuff because the FDA doesn't check it. They don't. I mean, so it's like... If you want to, like, testosterone, like, what are you going to put in there? Like, <clears throat> it is. I'm sure there's testosterone in your sweat. So just, like, sweat in a bottle and mix a few flavors in and just sell that stuff. Zach, that's a moneymaker. You know it. It does, doesn't it? But somebody would buy it. And if you put, like, Frank Thomas on the cover, just, like, flexing, uh, I guarantee it's a seller. The Oh, <laughs> Yeah, there's like that 80-year-old guy who takes his shirt off, and he, it's like, I don't know, right? I think something else is working there for you, but <clears throat> of course, when you're 80, take whatever you want. You're going to die soon. I, I mean, right? I mean, at that point, you hit 80, take all the supplements you want. Start shooting up the steroids for all I care. I mean, that's a, like, I've already got this plan, like this tiered plan of what I'm going to do as I get older. Like every decade, I think, I can add something because I'm going to die sooner. So it's like, you know, you work the time on that. Casey, you don't do that? You should. It's a way to plan your life. You know, most people, when they talk about life planning, they're thinking like retirement, insurance. Nope. Thinking about GNC supplements. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, who loves drunk monkeys? Yeah, yeah like a couple people raised their hand. <laughs> Yeah, um, so how many of you have heard that like alcohol increases aggressive behavior? If you haven't, I'm going to tell you now, alcohol increases aggressive behavior, okay? Just 
Hit, I know, right? So I think somewhere around every 12 out of 10 domestic violence cases involves alcohol. Uh, because I think there are some that just don't get reported that I'm certain involved alcohol, right? Uh, so, so it's 12 out of 10. You can do the math on that uh, if you'd like. <clears throat> but that's the way it works. So this is sort of an interesting story. Uh, there are like three or four conditions here, so we're going to have some layers, so let's think about that. You've got your mating season and your non-mating season, right? And a lot of, like humans don't really have a mating season and a non-mating season, right? But a lot of species do. And that's, uh, interestingly, Jiki, it's, it's normally related to availability of uh, uh, nutrition, right? So there are some species that will only mate during the fruit season because that's the only time they have the extra nutrients to, uh, you know, participate in those activities, right? So that's kind of a cool thing if you think about, like, some of those environmental factors, right? As humans, we don't really, the refrigerator's always there, right? So you've always got the extra energy to do whatever you want. But uh, other species don't have that sort of, they don't have a Kroger. <clears throat> So you can't just like go down and, and then, you know, buy some chicken and peaches or what I, I don't know what you're gonna buy. It's, it's just like thinking of two things. So there you go, right? So we've got mating season, we've got non-mating season. We have dominant monkeys and we have subordinate monkeys. And then we have monkeys that consumed alcohol and ones that didn't. Okay. What's interesting about this is your dominant monkeys are always going to be more aggressive than your subordinate monkeys, right? And that's how they became dominant. They were more aggressive and they beat down all the subordinate monkeys. And the subordinate monkeys, at least the bright ones, know probably shouldn't try to get into an aggressive encounter because guess what's going to happen? I'm going to get my head bashed in, right? so they're going to avoid that. <clears throat> what's interesting, uh, during the mating season, you don't really see a change in subordinate monkey behavior <clears throat> from control to alcohol, right? Okay, so there, no matter what happens during mating season, uh, subordinate monkeys know to not even try. Why? Because the dominant monkey definitely wants to participate in uh, sexual activities during mating season, right? Because they want to try to produce sort of offspring, so they're going to be extra aggressive. And if you notice, they're more aggressive during mating season whether or not they're drinking alcohol. But look at the massive increase <clears throat> in aggressive behavior during mating season between the control dominant monkeys and the alcohol uh, drinking dominant monkeys. That is a massive increase, right? So I really, I think, highlights some of the dangers of uh, drinking, drinking to excess, and then combining that with sort of amorous activities, right? Or uh, things that one person might think is going to be an amorous activity and the other person doesn't. I can really create some problems. That's my like uh, sort of life lesson. I'm required to tell you not to drink and try to rape people story, right? I think that the university makes me do that. But I think it's good advice in general. So, so there you go. Uh, in the non-mating season, <clears throat> dominant monkeys aren't as aggressive. They're not as interested in trying to fend off uh, other monkeys who are trying to mate with the females. And so you see less, and you see a less, a smaller increase. And aggressive behavior. Interestingly, those subordinate monkeys, you actually see a little bit of an increase from control to alcohol. Again, that's going to be a consequence of the dominant monkeys not being as aggressive. And so some of those subordinate monkeys might think, I can take advantage of that and see if I can move up the ladder just a little bit. Uh, and, and, and so they'll do that. <clears throat> they would not, not take a chance on that during the mating season because that's a bad idea. And again, uh, what's something <clears throat> that might be higher during the mating season than in the non-mating season in these monkeys? Huh? Yeah, testosterone, right? And so then you start mixing testosterone and alcohol and you really uh, can create some, some dangerous problems there. So that'd be something, right? Remember that testosterone dial we had? You guys are going to work on that. Um, just make sure I get at least 75% of the profits. Uh, you can turn down the testosterone if you know you're going to turn up your alcohol intake. I don't know. Seems like an interesting idea, right? What if you took a little Propecia with every, like, uh, glass of beer? Casey, I don't think that's going to work, is it? It's an interesting idea, though. IRB, we'll try that. <clears throat> Whoa, hey, how many of you have trouble with impulse control? All right. Oh, look, is there some... 
who always, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, <laughs> it happens almost every time. Okay. Who has trouble? Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, we knew that. Uh, so, thankfully, most of you exhibited some impulse control there. That's awesome. Uh, but we, again, want to revisit this idea of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. If we want to think about impulsive violence, right, this is different than sort of, uh, you know, like planned violence, right? Uh, something that you've actually considered, okay? <clears throat> this happens sometimes. So let's imagine you are, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you're part of a uh, military campaign, right? Seems like sort of a, a planned, uh, at least on the individual who's, who's carrying out those particular orders, that seems like a very sort of planned thing. That's not impulsive, right? Now, the individual who made the decision to initiate that campaign, that might have been impulsive, right? Someone might have said, hey, let's just go attack those people. That could be impulsive, but planned. Um, impulsive violence, we think about just sort of these random things where somebody will uh, participate in some, some violent activity. That's going to be because of a faulty emotion regulation. I know it's not a real shocker, right? It's like, well, of course, we knew that. Uh, but what you didn't probably know was that it's involving that ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And again, this is the guy telling the amygdala, like, hey, you probably don't need to get worked up about this, right? And so uh, you can think of situations where someone imagines um, an insult or that they've been slighted or something, and then they have some sort of response to that that's a, that's a little bit exaggerated, um, which is kind of interesting. How many of you have read this book, Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell? Anybody read that one? Oh, that's an interesting book. Casey, write that on your list to, to read. <clears throat> Just wrote it down. He actually talks about this interesting study that was in um, Michigan, I think, where they looked at people from, like, uh, Georgia, and they looked at people from, from the north. I don't know. They had some other places. Um, and it was about... Um, it was really sort of interesting about like aggressive interactions and how close they would walk to people and whether or not they'd get out of other people's ways when they were coming down the street. It was kind of an interesting sort of uh, sort of study. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was kind of fascinating. Some of you might enjoy it. <clears throat> oh, here's a picture of Phineas Gage and that giant missile he shot through his head. Right, it's a drawing of his skull. You're supposed to have one hole here. You're not supposed to have two. Okay, this is the bonus hole uh, that he made with that tamping rod. But look, yeah, I mean it's it, it was um, it's like a couple inches uh, in diameter. So I mean we're talking about a serious piece of steel flying through this guy's head, right? We're not talking about you know like a like a fencing rapier. Just, that's not going to do anything to you, you know. <clears throat> No, we're talking about an actual, an actual piece of, piece of steel, <laughs> taking up some space. But it, it just, I don't know. It, it's it's amazing the way that it, it the, the angle. There's there's no way you could try this. Like, I don't think you could line this up. You know, with like laser precision and do it again. I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend try. Like, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, Andre saying like, I got a great weekend project for a couple of my friends now. <laughs> we're gonna. We're gonna build a Phineas Gage replication device. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So I don't think you can pull it off because it's just full. fascinating. Oh, hey, who loves snakes? Okay, we got our weirdos there. Um, this is actually kind of interesting. This is an interesting fMRI study. Not quite as interesting as the Bring Your Partner fMRI study we talked about last week. I know so many of you found that fascinating. Uh, you probably started like looking for you know experiments in which you could participate that you know. See what happens, right? I mean, uh, so there you go. This is a fascinating one, um, <clears throat> which is really interesting. And they they were trying to measure courage, right? Okay, so they were trying to measure courage in this case, which is really interesting the way that they sort of defined it. They defined courage in this particular study as uh, what they how close will you bring this snake to you, right? And how close you. Because it's not, in there, uh, what they found was that it's not uh, about the amygdala. The amygdala is going to get activated by a snake, right? Uh, by a lot of people. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty reasonable reaction. But what they found was that folks 
who were able to bring the snake closer, they actually had an increase in activity in their ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? So their VMPFC was telling their amygdala, you don't really need to get worried about this. This snake is not going to harm you, okay? Uh, there was actually, like, you know, some protected barrier there, okay? So this snake is not, not going to be a problem, okay? You're, you're fine. Now, they also did this for a control. They put a toy bear. Of course, everybody was just like, oh, I'll bring that bear over. That's fine. And you didn't really see, uh, you know, uh, activation there in prefrontal cortex. But it's really fascinating uh, that you can directly measure courage not by amygdala activation, but by VMPFC activation. So maybe when I was designing that, you know, great quarterback, Juwan, I should not have removed his amygdala, but I should have just increased the size of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? That's probably better. Because you probably need the amygdala in those cases, uh, you know, to sort of, again, get the blood flowing, get those nutrients going, get those hormones going in case you need to make some sort of, you know, you got to make a, make a run or a move or something, right? But get that uh, VMPFC activated. So there you go. <clears throat> so that's kind of fascinating, right? Snakes on a conveyor belt. Yeah. It's just fascinating, right? That one we could probably get by the IRB if we had an fMRI and a conveyor belt and a snake. I think the toy bear is going to be easy to provide, but it's the other elements that, that might be tricky. Uh, brain development, we already talked about this, not a big deal. Kind of move on. Talked about the development of the amygdala over lifespan compared to your prefrontal cortex. Um, as you get to be an adult, that uh, prefrontal cortex development catches up to your amygdala. Early on, there's a gap where your amygdala is more developed than your prefrontal cortex, so you're going to have more sort of uh, fear responses. You're going to have more, uh, you know, sort of impulsive responses than if you were to get as an adult. If you think about someone with, uh, with a, an attention problem or an impulsivity problem, right, you might think about it as a gap between the activity of their amygdala and other brain regions and the activity of their prefrontal cortex, right? This is why one of the, um, one of the treatments for something like ADHD is actually a stimulant which doesn't really make a lot of sense on the surface, right? Like, why would you give someone who is already unable to sit in their chair a stimulant? It doesn't make any sense, right? But what that actually does is it will start to activate their prefrontal cortex, and their prefrontal cortex will start to tell the rest of their brain, sit down and just pay attention, right? And that's, um, that's one of the approaches for ADHD. Now there are, now there are some non-stimulant versions and, and, and medications as well, but but there you go. We should think a little bit about moral decision making, right? And this is not my attempt to give you like the go out and be good, good people lecture. I don't really care uh, about that. I mean, I do care that it, it, as long as you're not being a bad person around me. I guess I don't really care, right? Because you can do that elsewhere and I don't really know about it. Uh, so that's your business, and we're already past the point where you've paid tuition. So whatever happens to you, uh, I'm not gonna take my salary from it. So right, Casey. So we're we're good. We can just let people do that. <coughs> now, <coughs> there are moral decisions, and we'll talk about these. Um, in particular, we'll talk about the trolley problem. Are you guys familiar with the trolley problem? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting, right, Zach? So basically, the the idea is uh, we'll give you. Uh, a couple situations here, right? And so in situation A, you've got a trolley. A trolley, uh, for those of you that don't know, is like a little kitty train. Okay, so for those of you not trolley fans, just imagine it's a train, it's the same situation. Uh, it's coming down the tracks, and there's a choice point here. The trolley can go in either direction, right? And you've got a lever, and you've got to pull that lever, okay? And you have to send that train down one direction or the other. Now there are many, many variations of the trolley problem, right? There are ones where uh, we'll stick your, your best friend on one side and your mom on the other, or we'll put your sister over here and your mom here, we'll put your mom and your dad on different parts of the track. You gotta make decisions, right? And that just causes people's brains to explode. So you don't have to worry about that, right? I'm not gonna ask you to think about killing your parents. 
Last week I asked you to think about them having sex, and I thought that was pushing it. I'm not going to ask you to kill them this week, okay? You look really troubled by that. Hang in there. Just hang in there. We're going to get somewhere. So you're going to have to pull this lever, right? Because this trolley's got to go one direction or the other. There's no other option, okay? So don't try to come up with some magic solution here where you ride in on a unicorn and you make a rainbow track that's going to take it somewhere else. I, I know, right? You, you can't do that. All of those options are off the table. For whatever reason, you need to tell yourself they're off the table, okay? Largely because I told you they were. Your only choice is to either send the trolley down here to kill one person or to kill five people. Now, we are going to assume for this particular problem, now we can make things different, right? We could make this one just guy, this guy could be really nasty, and these could be five super great people. Um, or these could be five really nasty people, and this could be one super great person, right? And so there are all these, again, variations you can think about later. For our purposes, all these guys are going to be equally good or bad, right? Okay? In general, the solution here is to, of course, kill one person, right? If you had the choice to kill one person or five people, all else being equal. All else being equal. All else being equal. And we're not going to assume you're one of those, like, voluntary extinction people, right? Okay, so we're not looking at environmental impacts here of the four additional people, so we're going to throw that out the window as well. All else being equal, you're going to kill one person instead of five, right? Because okay, that's, that's four less sets of harm that you're causing someone, right? And so if we're just trying to cause less harm, we're just going to kill one person versus five. It's a fairly easy, easy situation, right? You're not really involved in this. You've got to pull a lever one way or the other. Uh, you're not really personally involved in the lives of any of these individuals, right? You're not going to be interacting with them in any particular way, right? And so it's just got to make that choice. And people do, right? And there's a certain amount of brain activity, obviously, in various regions while people are kind of working through this and they saw it. In the second example we want to see here is sort of a similar situation. You've got a trolley coming down on a single track, and you're on a bridge with this other guy. And again, we're going to assume for our purposes, this guy and these five people are identical, right? All else is, everything's going to be equal. The difference this time, Casey, this is a real difference. You've either got to let this trolley come through and kill these five people, or you've got to push this guy off. And, Adriana, you cannot jump in front of the trolley. We're going to assume for, I don't know, physics, this guy is the only guy who can stop that train, right? Okay? Not you. You're not able to do that. Okay? So you have to push the guy off or let these five people get killed. This is a completely different problem, right? <clears throat> and the problem is that you are now personally inflicting harm on someone, right? Over here, you weren't. Over here, you could really look at this as a harm reduction problem, right? Because you're either going to let five people die or one person die, and this solution reduces harm that you're, that, that's being caused by four, so you're getting a plus four. Okay? It's pretty straightforward. Here, it's a completely different problem, right? You might get a minus one because you're killing that person, uh, and then you've got to think about, well, if I just let people die, what's that come out to? Right? And that's somewhere between a minus five and a, and a minus one, right? I don't know what you're going to decide that is, right? You might decide it's even a zero, right? It's like, well, if I just let people die, it's not on me, right? This problem really gets your MPFC worked up in a way that this problem over here doesn't, okay? Because, again, you're making that moral decision, right? This, this first problem is not really a moral decision. It's simple math. It's one versus five, right? And you just you pick the one and you're done with it. Okay? I'm not saying it's easy, right? but I'm saying it's much easier that here, where you actually have to push this person, okay? you've actually got to physically inflict that harm on someone, so it becomes a completely different situation. There are some other situations here that we could think about where uh, you would uh, you know, give people some brownies, whatever, not a big deal. As you move into, uh, that's just a non-moral situation. Um, you know, you put macadamia nuts in for walnuts, who cares, right? Just so you don't have to eat walnuts. Not a moral decision at all. It's just related to nuts. 
I don't know why you would pick macadamia nuts over walnuts. That seems like a stupid choice to me. You're welcome to do whatever you want. Okay, Brownies and nuts don't matter. Um, there's a situation here where you've got to steal some guy's boat so you can go save some people. Not really a personal situation, right? Because it's not your boat. You're not really doing anything. Then as you move to the third situation, uh, you've got this lifeboat. Imagine you're in a lifeboat with someone and uh, your lifeboat's sinking, right? And it's you and like four or five other people. Now the question becomes, uh, you've got this guy who's injured and they're probably going to die anyway. Okay, do you throw that person overboard now? Do you wait until they die and you sink the whole ship, the whole lifeboat? You know, what do you do? That becomes a, that's a very personal moral decision you have to make, right? Uh, for most people, as you move through these scenarios, again, you're going to get more VMPFC activity there in that personal moral scenario, right? So that's something to think about. Most of you may not end up in a lifeboat. Uh, but some of you may end up in a zombie apocalypse. You've always got to be willing to kill that guy who knocks on your door. If you don't, just give him everything you own and move on. Right? You've got to make that choice, right, Zane? I mean, that's you, you got to make that choice. <clears throat> Keep it to yourself, and we'll assume you're a normal person. <laughs> that's the best way to do it, right? Yeah, I, I, I think for some people it's easier to say. I would definitely just go ahead and toss that guy overboard and say I'm sorry. And for some people would say, what if you were the person who was injured? Would you be willing to say, toss me over, sorry guys, name a dog after me. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, some people are in that group, right? And, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything bad about you. Um, I, I mean, it is possible you're a sociopath, but actually, I mean, there are probably four or five sociopaths in this class. I've seen estimates as high as like 10 or 15% of all people are sociopaths, right? So it doesn't mean you're an evil person, right, Right, Calvin? I mean, it just means, well, somebody's got to die. It's not going to be me or these other four people. Uh, we'll toss over the guy who's got like a harpoon through his chest. Let's go ahead and let him sink, right? Because he's not going to live anyway. Uh, it's the personal interaction, right? So if you're pulling the lever, you're not really connected and you're not actually causing the death, the death is going to happen one way or the other, right? When you're actually pushing someone, you're directly causing their death, right? By pushing them in front of the trial. So it's a little different. This is why I always fight against trolleys. You know, <laughs> you know we don't want trolleys for public transit. I think this is why they took them out in San Francisco. Too many people were just trying. No. Uh, <laughs> So they actually, I think there are other reasons why they took out the trolleys uh, in a lot of cities. Right, a lot of cities used to have trolleys, um, and then like you know, large automotive and like uh, petroleum companies said, "Hey, we're not making any money off this. How about we donate some money to your campaign and you get rid of these trolleys in your city?" And people say, "Oh, that's great. We'll do that." And this happened a long time ago. This is not a new thing. Like buying influence and political situations, not something that's been created in your lifetime. Okay. It happened probably that first time one guy found a bigger stick than the other guy. And that guy that didn't have the big stick said, you know what I do have is two apples. And I bet I could give you one of those if you were willing to use that big stick to hit this other guy for me. And that was probably the first time somebody bought political influence. Probably. See, Casey, if I was a great artist, I'd do that in a comic strip. That'd be brilliant, right? Yeah. Uh, so, we've decided we have emotions, right? Uh, and, and those emotions make us do things. Sometimes it's important to communicate that emotion to someone else, right? How many of you, uh, you don't have to answer this, let's assume you all have lived with someone in your lifetime, right? I'm assuming at least as a child you lived with someone else, right? Uh, if you don't live with someone now, that's your business. Um, if you do live with someone, that's also your business, right? So let's say you come home and that other person is, uh, and, and you guys all know this, right? They have that face, right? They've got that, that face and you just know, I think I'm just going to 
I don't know, go outside and dig a hole for a while. So I'm not, you just need to be by yourself, right? Just gonna, I think I got something to do in another state. I'll be back in a few hours. Uh, because being at home is not gonna be, right? Whatever you do is not gonna be the right thing. You know, it's, well, Casey, do you make that face at home sometimes? Not you, never you, right? Uh, but you know someone who probably does, right? You've seen it, right? You've seen that face up. Uh, so it's important to convey those emotions, right? So you know, how can I respond to this other person? How can I interact with them? Uh, somebody's like, you don't want to go, like, wow, man, I had the greatest day ever. You want to hear about it? No. Uh, of course not, right? Uh, so you really need to be aware of these other, other people's emotions. Other people's emotions can help you, and we'll talk about this in a few moments, avoid situations that might be harmful to your life. Okay, so this is awesome. So, what's really cool is that facial expressions seem to be innate. And what we mean by that is, you don't have to teach people to smile when they're happy. It just happens. You don't have to teach people to scowl when they're angry. It just happens, right? And we know this for, from a couple line, uh, lines of evidence. One is cross-cultural studies. Every time someone has studied another culture, they have sort of a handful of faces that they all make, right? There's the, uh, the, the happy face, like you ask somebody, hey, what kind of face you make when you're happy? You just, let's say your friend just showed up and he brought, you know, 10 bucks for you. Like, oh, I'm gonna be happy, I'm gonna smile. Uh, what about you just found out a friend or family member died? You're just, oh, I have a sad face, right? Um, and then my favorite face, um, and this was actually a question from a study that was done in New Zealand. They asked, because New Zealand has a, for those of you that, that don't know, um, not New Zealand. I'm on the wrong island. Yeah, New Guinea, thanks. Yeah, New Guinea has so many language and culture groups that, that you can very quickly move from one to the other. So they asked this guy in New Guinea, they said, hey, what kind of face do you make um, You know, if you were walking down the road and you came up on a pig carcass that's been there for a few days? Uh, so it's the dead pig face. It's my favorite face, and it's like, you know, it's this face of disgust, right? And disgust is a very important emotion. Uh, and it's a very important emotion to convey to other people, as we'll talk about in a few moments. So cross-cultural studies, uh, and also studies of people who are congenitally blind. So people who are born blind, right? So if you've been born blind, guess what happens? You've never seen another facial expression, okay? So you don't know that when someone else is happy, particularly your mom or dad, that's probably who you spend most of your time with, when they're happy, they smile. But guess what happens when you're happy? You still smile, right? So even though you've never seen that happen, you still do it, right? And so those two lines of evidence, the cross-cultural studies and the uh, studies with the congenitally blind, uh, kind of tell us those facial expressions are innate, right? And here you go. These are actually images, uh, and there's the dead pig face. Uh, and and that's, that's my favorite, uh, the dead pig face. I mean, it is just, it is. That is the face you would make if you saw a dead pig that had been there for a few days. And then, so then there are the other, uh, the other faces as well. Uh, this is the uh, sort of the happy face. This is the sad face, and this is the um, you just took the last donut face. <laughs> that's that's the uh, that's that face. <clears throat> uh, we can talk about perception of emotions a little bit. Uh, that happens a lot out in the prefrontal cortex. We are looking at meanings of words, but also the tone of the words. Right? That makes a big difference, uh, tone of words. You can say the exact same sentence to someone and it, and it, and it comes across in a completely different way. Uh, one example is sarcasm. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that. Uh, but, but sarcasm is, uh, is something where you, you know, you would say like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, I've, I've never used sarcasm in my life, so it's really difficult for me to come up with an example here. Um, you know, when you would say something like, of course I want you to, you know, come in the house with those muddy shoes on, right? Somebody's probably said that to me a few times. Um, it's, it's, so you don't mean that, right? You, you, you mean something the opposite, and that tone makes the difference, right? That tone and that context, and you have to be able to, to analyze it. I just think about this. Anybody a Seinfeld fan? Uh, you know, the, the, these pretzels are making me thirsty. Uh, that if, if you've not seen it, that is the best example of how tone uh, Kramer, for those of you that are, maybe briefly know the show, he gets a, a walk-on part in a Woody Allen movie. There's so much about this story that like 
is problematic now, right? Now that I'm, I'm retelling this. I'm like realizing exactly how problematic this story is. And I apologize for that ahead of time. Or after the time. I've already started it. Uh, anyway, and his line is supposed to say, these pretzels are making me thirsty. And that's like the only guidance he gets. And he doesn't know, should I say, these pretzels are making me thirsty? Or these pretzels are making me thirsty. You know, and he's like, these different ways that he could say, these pretzels are making me thirsty. And it's really, he like, troubles with this the whole time. And then in the end, he ends up breaking the beer glass and sort of making Woody Allen mad, which is, now that's a less problematic thing to say. Right? You know, we're, we're there. Hey, uh, <clears throat> so we didn't really talk about this when we um, when we talked about the visual system, and, and I wish I had because um, it's something called Blindside, um, and it was kind of interesting. So folks will have damage to their visual cortex, uh, and so they won't be able to see things. Right? You hold up an album, you say, "We learned." I have no idea. Um, interestingly, they still have some uh, visual information that reaches parts of their brain. Uh, in particular, it's related to visual motion. So you can take these individuals, and I wouldn't recommend this normally, uh, but you can take these individuals who are blind and have them walk down the hall and put things in front of them, like trash cans and chairs. Um, and again, I would not normally rec I know, right? You're thinking this is funny. So now we know who the, the weirdos are in the class, right? Uh, but these individuals, assuming that it's just damage to their visual cortex and not something else, they can actually dodge those obstacles, right? Because that motion information, is, visual motion is still being processed even though like conscious perception of objects is not. They won't be able to tell you I'm walking around a trash can, but they will just do it. They also will be able to kind of determine facial expressions. So <clears throat> you can show pictures to these guys and they will say, well, I don't see anything. <clears throat> and then you say to them, well, I'm just showing you a facial expression. Uh, just take a guess. Guess what it is. Is it a happy face or a fearful face? And they will most of the time correctly guess that they are looking at a happy face or a fearful face, whatever it is. Additionally, <clears throat> in addition to that guess, uh, they will actually mimic the facial expression they're seeing. So how many of you have ever had someone smile at you? What do you do in return? You smile, right? I mean, it, it's a, it's, <clears throat> it's, you have to really try not to smile back, right, if somebody does smile at you. And so these individuals, when they see uh, a smiling face, they will also smile. If they see a frowning face, they will also frown. Right? And so they will mimic that facial expression. Even though they cannot tell you that they're seeing it, some of that visual information is still being processed, which is kind of fascinating. <clears throat> All right, we talked about these guys. Laterality, most emotion is going to be processed in the right hemisphere. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean it's all processed in the right hemisphere, right? Yeah, yeah, right hemisphere. Uh, and the reason, so this is something you can do too. <clears throat> uh, I want everybody to go home, not now, but at the appropriate time. Go home, and the first thing I want you to do is get a mirror. I want you to get right in front of that mirror, and I want you to make a facial expression. But like a real one, don't fake one, right? Because... Um, <clears throat> I guess we should talk about method acting now, right? You guys know about method acting? Anybody a method actor? Nobody's a method actor. If you were a method actor and you were good at it, you wouldn't be in this class. You, you, you would probably be filming you know, some project, right? Uh, so method acting is when you really try to get yourself into a mental and emotional state to match the situation that you're trying to, to act out, right? <clears throat> what that does is that allows you to better mimic uh, facial expressions, right? So how many of you have ever had one of those fake smiles thrown at you, right? Y yeah, all the time, right? And so what happens with a fake smile is it really involves, um, or does not involve, <coughs> your, uh, your eyelids, right? So like if it's a real smile, it'll kind of pull your eyelids down at the same time that you smile, okay? If it's a fake smile, you don't involve your eye. Yeah, you're trying it, right? You can't fake a smile. <laughs> Uh, trust me, that's, that's not going to get you anything. <clears throat> I walked around a whole week like that once as an experiment. And I will say this, uh, you'll be surprised how many people let me go in front of them in the checkout line. <laughs> so looking at people like, hey, you can just go ahead. I was like, oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Um, 
but it's going to involve your your eyelids pulling down a little bit. So when you do smile, and it's a real smile, always look. Don't look at their mouth. The mouth is just a decoy. Okay, you got to look at the eyes, and you got to see if their uh, their eyelids kind of pull down a little bit at the edges. And if they do, then you know it's a real smile. If it's not, uh, they're just two faced. And that's all. <laughs> Sarah thought that was funny. Now you're thinking like a whole bunch of people you're going to test this on, right? You're like, I'm going to start looking at your eyes now when you smile. You just watch. You're not going to fool me anymore. Um, so there you go. So if you're a method actor, you try to get into that sort of same emotional frame. And then that way when you smile, you're not going, like fake smiles, you're actually giving a real smile. And you're actually getting your eyelids involved. And it's a very convincing sort of, um, <clears throat> sort of acting, right? That's kind of cool, right? I mean, you guys, anybody know someone in the theater department who's, who's considering acting uh, as a career? You could tell them that trick. It's always a great one. So when they're when they're up there on stage and they're like, really, just, just have them do this, like pull down part of their eyes while they smile. It's, it's very realistic. Doesn't really work. So why was I telling you about method acting? Oh, because I want you to go home and look in a mirror. Right. So what's interesting is because the right hemisphere is a little bit more involved in emotional processing than the left hemisphere, when you smile, your left face, left side of your face, will actually be slightly more expressive than the right side of your face. Right? And so if you were to take a picture of you smiling, like a real smile, and you were to cut that picture in half and then do two mirror images, right? what you would see is if you showed the two right sides of your face, you'd get a smile like this. And then if you showed the two left sides of your face, you'd get a smile like this and it'd be much more pronounced, right? More uh, involvement in your cheeks, your mouth, your, your nose might flare a little bit more, and your eyelids uh, would pull down more. On the, uh, I know, right? You're going to go home and check this, right? Just try to get in front of the mirror and make yourself smile. That's a trick. Um, I don't know. But you can check your photos, like all your selfies, Right, go back and look at all your selfies and like, like think about the ones you've sent people that weren't real smile self. Like you were just like Casey, just doing it because like I gotta send this person a smiley self. Uh, and then you go like, oh geez, my eyes weren't involved. They're gonna know now. Like most people don't really know this to look at the eyes, right? So there you go. See how I try to make this relatable to your life, and really try to bring in things like selfies, you know, your Facebook profiles. You guys still have Facebook? That's stupid. <clears throat> if you get rid of Facebook. I mean, they're going to get rid of you as soon as they've learned everything about you. I'm going to toss you off like an empty husk. You don't know that, JP? They're just stealing your data, a bunch of data miners. I have yeah, I have a real problem. They still haven't figured out that I'm going to touch your There's clearly a problem with the <laughs> yeah, that that happens. I don't know. There's just sort of a problem with this, like, like thinking, like, man, this is like the coolest thing ever. When it started out as this guy, basically like a hot or not sort of website that he hacked from, like, student IDs, right? I mean, I just feel like I don't know if we got to celebrate that um, because that seems to me like something that'd get me in a lot of trouble. Like, if I was just to, like take all of your student IDs and put them up on a website and said, hey, pick whoever's most attractive, I really feel like I would lose my job over that. And this guy's like become a billionaire. It's like I'm not certain that's right. Which track am I going to put him on on the trolley problem? <clears throat> and am I a beneficiary in his life insurance? That's the first question you always ask, Calvin. Who's the beneficiary in the life insurance policies? I'm really trying to go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, ta -da -ta 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 -ta. Don't worry about this too much that's not terribly important um, these are people clearly not making she's really not involved in that face right you can tell that's a fake face facial expression so don't worry about it <clears throat> so this is interesting folks who you know have their amygdala is intact they will often spend a lot of time looking at people's eyes right uh, and based on what I just told you but you didn't know Right? Like you can actually tell if someone's smiling by looking at their eyes. Right? We all knew you can tell if someone's angry, right? When they're looking because they their eyes get kind of beady and you just have to really look at this part of someone's face to determine the facial expression, right? Now, if you have damage to your amygdala, 
you actually start spending a lot of time looking at their, their mouth. And that's why I tell you the mouth is a decoy, right? The mouth is just not really really what you need to focus on. If you want to focus on someone's emotional, uh, the emotion they're trying to convey, you definitely want to be looking at their eyes. <clears throat> okay, The eyes are the window to the soul. Or at least the window to the you know, brain mechanisms behind their facial expression. So that's pretty cool, right? Now you're going to like weirdly start looking in people's eyes when you see them. Right? Stare at them. <clears throat> okay, so we should also talk about what we call perception of direction of gaze and the recognition of disgust. This is important. I want you to go back and I want you to think about that dead pig. Right? And I want you to think about someone who's like looking over this way going... And what you know is a couple things. One, they're looking that direction. Right? So you've got some neurons that are going definitely over there. The second thing where when you look at their face and you go, that's the dead pig face. Something over there is disgusting, so what should I do? Go over and jump right in the middle of it. No, you should clearly walk around that, right? Because you know what disgusting things do? They make you sick, right? A dead pig has a few things on it. Uh, germs, parasites, a variety, and not necessarily just, you know, uh, microbial parasites, but even bigger parasites, all kinds of nasty things. So, here's the response. This is a single neuron in the cortex uh, of a monkey's brain. This is out in a brain region that's going to do uh, uh, gaze direction, which is kind of interesting. So they showed this picture to the monkey, and they measured the activity of that particular cell. What's really interesting about this, okay, because I, I, I've been telling you, Cameron, continuously, it's the eyes. The eyes are what's important, right? And if you look at this face and this face, both of the heads are tilted up, okay? But in this case, the eyes are also up. In this case, the eyes are coming out straight. That cell did not get as excited for the head that's tilted up, but the eyes that are going somewhere else. It did get excited for this face straight on, but what are the eyes doing? The eyes are also going up. And even in profile, you get the same thing. Okay. So these direction of gaze neurons are really interested in the eyes and which direction are the eyes going. And this is just one cell. There are other cells that are for the different directions of gaze, right? So don't think you've only got one cell interested in looking up uh, or knowing that other faces are looking up. You've got uh, cells that are interested in, in you know, other, other directions of gaze as well, okay? So they're going to get excited about that. But it's the eyes, the direction of the eyes, not the direction of the face. That's important, right? Because many times people will look one direction with their face and kind of look back with their eyes, right? I'm sure none of you have ever done that. <clears throat> right, like when you're taking an exam and you're trying to look at your paper and not look over at somebody else's. Uh, <clears throat> I see that happen sometimes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uh, we could talk a little bit about the mirror neuron system, which is actually a very interesting system. Uh, Casey, did you talk about that a little bit during the movement chapter? A little bit? Okay. So we'll revisit that just a little bit. Uh, we actually, again, this is about the um, sort of... When we... When we see someone else, uh, you know, making a facial expression, uh, you know, we have we have brain cells that get excited about that. Some of those are the same ones that get excited when we make that facial expression, right? And so it's about sort of connecting uh, what other folks are doing with what we're doing, which is really kind of an interesting, interesting process. Mm, don't worry about this too much. Really, here we're just thinking about you know right hemisphere doing a little, being a little bit more involved in. Um, motion processing. This is sort of an interesting study that was conducted uh, by the BBC Science website a number of years ago. And what they were looking at here was what are things that are disgusting, you know, that make you disgusting uh, or make you disgusted and why is that and what can we, what can we determine from, from those things. So what they would do is they would present two very similar images to people, right? And so if you look at this top image, 
for example, both of these are very similar images, right? The only difference really is the color of the fluid, okay? Uh, most people would rate this particular image as more disgusting, right, than the other image. And I think most of you would agree with that, right? If I said, which one is more disgusting, you'd probably pick that one. The reason that you would pick that uh, may not be immediately evident, okay? Uh, but it is, how many of you have ever cleaned up bodily fluids from another person? Okay, a, a few of you have, right? Was it ever this color? I mean, no, 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 most of the, no, most of the time it's probably this color, right? Or, or some variation of that, okay? So, that's going to be more disgusting, right? Someone else's uh, dinner that they've already eaten um, is sort of disgusting if you see that later, right? In, in whatever form it comes, right? If it, if it takes the elevator up or the elevator down, it's either way you go, it's going to be something sort of disgusting, right? Not everybody got that one. JP did. That one connected with you, right? <clears throat> That's uh, vomit or defecation. Okay, there you go. Just clearing that up for the rest. Huh? Gotcha. Uh, here's an interesting one. Give you, this is the same guy, both times. Uh, and we say, hey, which one of these is more disgusting? I think this guy is. And the reason for that is, is what does he look like? If you saw a picture of that guy, or if you saw that guy, you would ask him, how are you feeling today? Right? He looks like he's sick. He's sweating. That's a sign of a fever, right? Signs that he's got some sort of parasitic infection that you might get. How many of you want to get a parasitic infection? Yeah, nobody's signing up for that, right? Okay. So people are going to bypass that. Uh, here's an interesting one on the subway. Which is more disgusting? The one with people. What do people have? Diseases. You can get those diseases. Here's another bodily fluid. This one's just nasty. I mean, look at that. That looks horrible, right? That's really bad. Uh, hey, what about this? These little tent caterpillars versus... Anybody know what those are? Yeah, yeah, an intestinal parasite, right? Nobody signs up for that one either. Man, I'd love to get a nice tapeworm. Uh, said no one. I promise you. Um, and then here's another one with some sort of, I don't know if that's a hornet. We'll go with that. And then some sort of other disease-causing insect there. That looks exciting, right? And again, these guys are all related to diseases, and these are not, right? And so diseases are something you want to avoid. And you do that by looking for people making the dead pig face. If you see someone on campus, Sarah, and they're making the dead pig face, which you are sort of making now, uh, looking at these images, right? They make you do that. Don't walk over and see what it is. Assume it's something you don't want to be around and avoid it, right? It's just for your own health. All right, we could talk a little bit about volitional versus emotional facial paresis. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. For volitional facial paresis, uh, you ask people, hey, show me your teeth, and they go, they don't do anything. Uh, but then you tell them a good joke, and they go, oh, man, that was hilarious, and they, they laugh or they smile. You can see their teeth, and you're like, well, why couldn't you show me your teeth earlier? All right. For emotional facial paresis, you go, hey, show me your teeth, and they go, uh, and then you say, hey, um, listen to this great joke I know, and then they go, yeah, that was funny. Uh, um, tells you there are two different brain circuits, right? There are emotions, uh, and then there are sort of, um, you know, your, your voluntary choices. And because they're controlled by different brain circuits, and facial expressions have their own, like, emotional facial expressions have their own brain circuits who control this, right, which is really interesting, which is why you cannot fake a good smile, right? So whenever you see that person who you absolutely hate, if you really want to give them a good smile, Imagine you're kicking their teeth in. And then you'll just grin from ear to ear. Your eyes will come down on the outside, which is going to be great, right? Jakia, you're going to write this down. This is going to be helpful to you. I promise. Da -da -da, we talked about that. Not too big of a deal. Right hemisphere, we talked about that. Eh, don't worry about that too much. Should I tell them about this? I don't really like it. I could skip it. Yeah, it's not that important. 
uh, there's some idea, uh, you know, a couple of these guys, and this guy William James, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's not that important uh, to psychology <laughs> at all. Um, it's not like he's called the father of psychology or anything. Right? Some people call him that. I've heard people call him that. That's what we'll call him. Uh, so, so William James, actually, he had a brother. Anybody heard of Henry James? Nobody's heard of Henry James? I'm a little disappointed. Um, what? What is Henry James is probably one of the greatest authors of all time, right? I mean, he wrote uh, Portrait of a Lady, I believe is one of his most famous works. Obviously, I've never read any of it. I don't know. Um, so I shouldn't be that disappointed in you. I should at least know who he is. Uh, anyway, they were brothers, very, very influential. Some have said William James was the better writer, and Henry was actually the better psychologist, uh, which, is, which is sort of interesting that they went into different fields. But uh, basically their idea is like, well, you know... You don't really feel emotions until you've actually done something, and it's those behaviors that make you feel the emotions, right? So you're not going to be aggressive until you punch someone in the face, and then you'll feel the aggression inside. It's like, well, I guess, you know, sometimes maybe you can make yourself, by, by doing an activity, you can make yourself feel, uh, you know, feel that emotion. There was like the, the pencil study. You guys know about the pencil study where they just got to hold the pencil between your nose and your lips? And then they would like ask people, well, how do you feel afterward? Like, I just want to run somebody over because I've been holding this pencil under my nose. Um, I don't know. I feel like I should tell you about it, but I'm not going to ask you about it because I don't think it really matters to me. And then there's like babies. They'll do whatever you do, which is kind of fun if they're not your baby. Uh, and you can teach them all, teach them all kinds of great habits, right? Um, I don't know if anybody's around little kids that don't belong to you. Um, that sounded weird. <laughs> um, but I was thinking, like, if you've got nephews or nieces, right, or little cousins or something, you can teach them very inappropriate things to do, um, and then just make sure you tell them to say someone else taught them. That's always, that's the trick. Don't tell them, like, yeah, tell them I taught you that. Always blame it on, like, your other sister. Right, that's what I do. Yeah, that's the best. Okay, so there you go. Any questions about that? I don't think there's anything else I need to tell you about emotions.